my name is Ben. Sorry for the dodgy setup, but this is the best I can do <laughs> without having to get someone to film it for me because uh, I feel like that'd be really awkward. Uh, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 34, and I've titled this Despite Pursue. Uh, in a wee bit of background uh, of this passage, Paul is writing uh, to the church in Philippians. Uh, he is in prison at the moment. Uh, when he was in prison, he wrote three different letters. Uh, this is one of the letters. Uh, and he's writing this letter, and the letter is full of thanksgiving and joy. That's the main name of this letter. Uh, Paul wants him to know his joy and wants him to know his thanksgiving. Uh, Ruth touched on the start of the letter last week, which was the big bit on thanksgiving prayer. This week, we're going to look at uh, the second kind of part of the letter, which uh, is it's split into two, but we're going to look at them together because I think one leads into the other quite well. And I've titled this Despite Pursue because I feel like Paul kind of lays out one thing and then go, one thing, go, one thing, go. Uh, so we're going to read through it now. If you have a Bible, pause the video. If you don't have a Bible, uh, go get a Bible. And then if you have a Bible, just follow along. Uh, so reading from verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And for most of the brothers, having been confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defence of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through the prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is with my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always with Christ, will be honoured in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die in gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labour for me. Yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for by far that is better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glorify in Christ Jesus, to glory in Christ Jesus, because of my own, because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of live life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, and that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving by side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. That is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaging in the same conflict that I saw, that you saw I had and I hear that I still have. It's a bit of a heavy passage. We're going to break it down into four uh, quite simple points, which are going to kind of help explain it. And the first point is, despite persecution, Paul advances the gospel. Uh, Paul opens this passage by laying out his situation of prison. Uh, Paul is... In chains, if you read from Acts chapter 20 through to chapter 27, you can see that it's laid out in that that Paul goes through trial after trial, after persecution after persecution, after shipwreck, to finally being here in prison. And he is, he is put through his suffering, he is put through his trial. But it is in the spite of the persecution, despite of the suffering that he has been in, he still has one-minded goal. Paul lays out in this passage a one-minded goal that his life, his focus, that his main aim is fully on Christ. And the same way, later in the passage, he calls us to that exact same aim, uh, that if it wasn't for Christ Jesus, we would be dead in our sins and trespasses, but we're made alive through him. That Paul's main focus, his main aim here, is the advancement of the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus came to this earth as the Son of God, died and rose again on the third day. That is the gospel. And why did he do it? He did it for our sins, to save us for our sins. And everything he did was for that. In fact, everything he did, Paul Paul did for that, was so evident, so clear, that the people who imprisoned him, the people who put him in jail, uh, the guards who were keeping him there, uh, knew that he was in prison for Jesus Christ. He was in chains for Jesus Christ. Uh, and it didn't stop him being in chains. In fact, it emboldened him and kept him going. Uh, looking at our situation now, we are not in physical chains, but we are in metaphorical chains by literally being locked in our houses. Uh, and does everyone then know, despite that, that we are living our life to advance Christ? Despite the, the persecution, 
no, literally, but the, the trapping in our house, are we still aiming to advance the gospel in the same way Paul did? The next kind of bit is, uh, the next kind of bit is verses 19 through to 26, which I've labelled, despite what happens, what happens to us, pursue Christ, for to be with him is better. Okay, uh, Paul lays out that to live is Christ. Uh, he kind of sums this up in the statement of, to, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If we are alive, we should be alive and living in a way which is pleasing and holy to him. We should be alive and living in the same way where Paul talks about his labour, what he does should bring glory to him and should be good for Christ. What we do in our day-to-day -day lives should be worthy of living for him. And not only that, but that by living worthy for him and by advancing his gospel, uh, it is it is necessary and good thing by living a life which is worthy for Christ, by living a life which shows his uh, gospel despite what we may hear from people telling us that uh, he's not real, telling us that it's not worth it, that we will ultimately be able to advance his gospel. Uh, but looking at this as well, uh, Paul talks about that whatever happens to us, uh, to pursue Christ. See, Paul even says that in death, it is gain. By dying, we gain because we go to be with Christ. As long as we are with him and we're secure in him, we have peace, we have comfort, we have joy, and we have salvation. And our salvation is assured in him. It's, our salvation isn't something which we are worried about ourselves, which we have to attain ourselves, which we do work for, but it's completely secure in him. And knowing that it is secure in Christ, therefore we can go and we can preach his word and we can declare and tell and advance the gospel in the same way Paul did without fear. Because we know that we are safe and sound in him. There's nothing which is going to take away from that. Even if we die, we are, we are in a better place because we are then with him in heaven rather than by ourselves, separated and alone, uh, which is the other option. And then, despite what happens to us, pursue Christ, for to be with him is better. And then off the back of that, despite our own desires, pursue Christ, living a life worthy of him, which is starting in verse 27, 28. Uh, where Paul calls us in view of pursuing Christ and living a life worthy for him, we then need to live a life which is worthy of the gospel. He is calling us to live a life which is uh, which is see-through, which is transparent, which isn't, which is is completely uh, visible to everyone around us, that we're living with one cause, that we're not hiding parts of our lives, that we aren't living in sinful ways and sinful manners, that we aren't keeping that one sin to ourselves, that we aren't holding on and being, and being selfish, that we aren't being mean, that we aren't being... Uh, Self-centered that we aren't using our time in this time of persecution just to lie around and be lazy in persecution in this time of isolation uh, that we aren't lying around being lazy and just wasting our time but that we're living our life in a manner which is worthy of the gospel that we're doing work that we're progressing that we're pushing forward in the mission which Christ has set us for and that by pushing forward and living a life life worthy of this that our joy will be made complete in him uh, Paul talks about striving side by side through the faith of the gospel striving is like like, have you ever been, like, in a wetsuit? I know, like, when I'm out in the wetsuit going to catch a wave with a surfboard, I am walking in the water and there's a real drag. Like, you feel like your legs are heavy and the water's pushing against them. It's really difficult and you're pushing forward. Well, that's what striving is. That's what we need to do in advancement of the gospel. Therefore, I turn the question to you guys. How do you strive forward in advancing the gospel in this time of living a life worthy of Christ is by picking up books and learning more and more about who he is, about his doctrine, about his truth. Is it by... Is it by starting uh, a Bible study with your friends on Zoom or having calls with your friends on Zoom and talking about how you're learning and loving about God, learning, loving God in this time? What is it which produces, uh, which firstly helps us advance the gospel and which secondly is living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ? Uh, if you're meeting on Zoom after this, you maybe talk about that. And then finally, uh, despite the suffering you must engage in, the Spirit will help you pursue Christ. Uh, I keep talking in this passage about advancing, about pushing forward, about pursuing, and all this sounds like a heck of a lot of work, but by understanding that we can't do this on our own, that is not our strength in which this is done, that Paul did nothing which he did in the strength he had, but it was it through the Spirit of God upon him which gave him the strength. The same Spirit of God which came upon us when we believed is what gives us the strength and energy and was what pushes us forward and does these things. We have no strength in ourselves to pursue Christ. But it's the spirit in us which gives us the strength and gives us the knowledge and joy to pursue him. And then in pursuing him, in going after that, Paul calls us and says that we must suffer. What you do for Christ, 
living for him will cause you to suffer. But that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope in Christ. And ultimately Paul writes this letter about joy and that his, our joy is made complete in Christ. By pursuing, by suffering for the sake of Christ, we become, we grow into Christ. And by growing into Christ, our joy is made complete in Christ. Ultimately, by suffering, we grow in joy and in love and together with him. And as only and suffering is only brought about by advancing the gospel, by living your life worthy of Christ. So off the back of kind of this, uh, where it's an awful lot, it's a very heavy passage, uh, I recommend reading it through again and trying to kind of sum summarise your thoughts. And you kind of think about uh, these three questions. One is, what can I do now to advance the gospel? What is there around me now which I can do to actively advance the gospel? And how does that look? And why should I do it? So what can I do? So, so why should I advance the gospel? What can I do to advance it? And how can I make that a possibility? The next question I want to look at is, uh, is am I living a life which is, which is, am I living a life which is fully for Christ? Is, am I living a life which is living is to Christ for me to live is Christ uh, if yes what am I doing in that life if no how can I live a life more like that and what's a practical way which I can live a life more like that and finally uh, finally uh, how do we live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ and in this time what does living a life worthy of the gospel of life look like on social media uh, so they are kind of like the the three, four, six questions. They're kind of packaged together. Uh, that I want you to look at. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, yeah, sorry it's a little bit weird to do an online video, but you can get over it. <laughs> <sighs>